Good morning and welcome to worship here at First Presbyterian Church in Walnut Ridge, Arkansas. My name is John Arnold. I'm the pastor here and I am delighted that you're worshiping with us. Now, we have today what I think is going to be a great service for you if you want to enrich your prayer life because we're going to look into the prayer that Paul prayed for the people at Ephesus and I know that as I prepared for this sermon, as I shared it with other people, that it expanded my view of how I ought to be praying for other people or could be praying in a way that has eternal value. So that's what we have in store for you today during worship. So grateful you are here. Now, with regards to any announcements, rather than walk through announcements for this week, because I have no idea when you might be viewing this. You might be viewing this months after we uh, have the activities that I'm going to talk about. I'm just going to say, check our website for uh, activity announcements. That uh, website is uh, fpcwalnutridge.org. So fpcwalnutridge.org. Go there. You can check out. We do regularly have yoga. Once a month we have a church supper, but details of all that will be on the website. So blessings on being here today. Now, to prepare our hearts to enter into this time of really being present to God, let's slow down. We're going to have a really lovely prelude this morning, and I would invite you during that prelude to kind of let go and take on an intention for the next 30 minutes or so to listen to God and give God the very best of your attention as we enter into prayer, listening to His Word, and singing Him. So. Blessings, friends. Here we go. Here's the prelude. in the call to worship you find in your bulletin. God created all things visible and invisible, none other. God is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine. Let's stand to sing our opening hymn number 610. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. Thank you. 
let's pause in prayer before we look at God's holy word this morning. Most holy God, you are a good, a gracious, a wondrous God. We praise you for your word, and right now we pray that we would hear it with understanding so that it it not only informs our mind, but it transforms the inner being of who we are, that we are more Christ-like in our attitudes and our behaviors. We love you, Lord, and we offer the ears of our heart, if you will, to you right now. And Lord, may your words uh, prevail over my words this morning, that I wouldn't just lift up good ideas, but instead a godly message. In Christ's name we pray, amen. All right, our Old Testament lesson this morning is from the Psalms. We are starting in Psalm 14, verse 1. Listen now to God's holy word. Fools say in their heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They do abominable deeds. There is no one who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on humankind to see if there are any who are wise who seek after God. They've all gone astray. They're all alike perverse. There's no one who does good. No, not one. Have they no knowledge, all the evildoers, who eat up my people as they eat bread and do not call upon the Lord? There they shall be in great terror, for God is with the company of the righteous. You would confound the plans of the poor, but the Lord is their refuge. Oh, that deliverance for Israel would come from Zion. When the Lord restores the fortunes of his people, Jacob will rejoice. Israel will be glad. And then we're also reading from Ephesians 3, 14 through 21. And I'm going to read through this actually twice. We're going to read through it once just so you can get the lay of the land uninterrupted. And then I want to go through it and I actually want to break down some really cool things that that are going on in the language here. And I don't want you to glaze over and think, okay, we're going to get a Greek lesson. This is going to be boring. (laughs) But there's some just some wonderful richness to this this passage that gets passed over in the way I think that we have, we tend to translate. So listen now closely as we go through it the first time. Beginning 14th verse. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. I pray that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through his spirit and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith as you are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses his knowledge so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. The word of the Lord. Okay. Before we go picking through this word by word, (laughs) I want to ask you to think about something for a moment. Who is the last person you prayed for? Who have you, you last or most recently prayed for? And what did you pray about? I want you to pull that to mind. Who have you recently prayed for and what did you pray about? And I want us to take some time to notice maybe differences or similarities between how we pray and how Paul prayed. Because to me, there's a glaring gap between how Paul prays and how I pray. <laughs> you know, I doubt I'm the only one there. I find that most people are just like I am in their struggles of faith. And Paul, I'm astounded at the fervency and the richness of the prayer he has for what is already the believing community around their faith. And I don't know about you, but I have this, I guess I didn't realize that I have sort of, I don't know if you'd call it a bias or assumption or what you would call it, but 
I tend to think of praying for people's spiritual need really only for people who are outside the church. You know, like I pray about people believing if I think they don't believe. What's fascinating about this passage is Paul's starting with the believers, and that's 100% what he's focused on, you know? And I was like, wow, all right, that, that really kind of slows me down and makes me rethink how I ought to be praying for my folks, my brothers and sisters in Christ. I mean, it's great to pray, and we need to pray for the situations in people's lives, the surgeries, the illnesses, the struggles, the job losses, all of those things. God wants to hear the concerns of our heart. Um, But what if we got all those prayers answered, and yet the people we've prayed for, for still have no functional relationship with the Lord? That's like a no-win-win, you know, at the end of the day. Because these other things, they will pass away, and they will come to pass. And what... Paul prays with eternity in mind. So, one last thing before we dissect this. I was listening to Francis Chin. He's a, he's a pretty astounding preacher and communicator. I don't know what his denominational background is or anything like that. But Francis Chin was preaching on this passage. And I thought he had a great illustration. I've never... Has anybody here watched The Deadliest Catch? I've never watched that show, but Francis Chen said, you know, it takes place, I think, up in the North Sea, and they, uh, or they crab fishermen or something like that, and they go out in these boats, and horrific, he said, they go out, and they fish, and they die. And it was like, well, that's pretty harsh, you know, but he said, you watch this footage, and the boat's just tossing and dashing about, and there's water splattering on the camera, and they're trying to hang on to anything they can, and tethered to things, and, you know, they're just fighting and riding the storm as they try to fish. And he used this as an illustration of this passage. He was talking about how rough, I'm going to put these words to it, how rough the world can be out there, that we can be looking out at the circumstance of our country, our culture, our neighborhoods, and it can look like a vicious storm that's about to take us down. And he was, he was saying, you know, we, can't, we cannot the church, we can't control the storm, we cannot control the environment that we're in. What we can do is do everything we can to keep the ship upright and everyone on board and not falling off. (laughs) Like, like we can do that as we fish. And um, that was really striking to me because that truly is fitting to what Paul's doing here. He says... Uh, for this reason, if we were to double back and look right before this, he says, I pray therefore that you may not lose heart over my suffering for you. There your glory. He's really concerned about the Ephesians losing heart and falling out of the boat, if you will. Uh, and I didn't think of it until just now, but I, whether you realize it or not, the, the, a boat is actually an old classic symbol of the church. If we were to go in like Renaissance church and medieval churches, they would have boats and ships like engraved sometimes on a baptismal font or in the walls, of, you know, and it was a rich symbol of the church, uh, the church as this boat or ship. So here we are, we're faced with this rough sea as a body of believers, we're on this boat, and here's what Paul would pray for. For them, and what I think we should pray for others, and I'm going to break this down because there's some cool word plays going on here. It says, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. And now, you're not going to see this in this text, so they do have a footnote that's a little helpful. It's, he's bowing his knee before the Father of fathers. And I flag that because throughout this whole passage, Paul takes and he intensifies literally almost everything he says by doubling up, doubling down on words. It's a very Jewish thing to do. Like if we were to go back and read the story of, say, Jonah, it'll talk about, and the winds were winding and the waves were waving, you know, which we don't do that. We, we kind of do. Sometimes we'll, we'll double up on words, but 
that's very Hebraic. And he's, it's leaking through here. He's talking about the father of fathers, but he's also talk, going to talk about in a moment, and you'll see this, sort of strengthening us, strengthening our strength, knowing the unknowable, um, uh, having the fullness of all God's fullness. So we'll watch for those as we go along. Um, I pray that according to the riches of His glory, He may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through His Spirit. Well, let me pause right there for a moment. He's praying that the grant you may be strengthened in your inner being with power. A couple things to flag. First off, that word strengthened means to be strong enough. It has this sense of having just enough strength. And I, we use a very theoretical word here um, on, when we talk about that you may be strengthened in your inner being and being, being with power through His Spirit. The words strengthen and power there are actually the same word repeated again. This is one of those repetitions that we don't see when we're reading it in the English. And uh, Barrett actually taught me something this last week. I didn't know there's a couple different words for power. The only one I was aware of in Greek is dunamos. This, is, this word here is neither dunamos, or the word that you taught me, which I don't remember right now, but it's a completely different word that has to do with strength. But he's saying, you know, that you may be strengthened. The, the word we translate power here, it's actually, again, a word for strength. And he's saying, you may be strengthened in your inner being with the strength of His Spirit. That's one of those double-down moments. That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I love this idea of dwell. Um, it means, that word means, it doesn't mean just to live somewhere, but it means to take up permanent residence there. It means to stick there for good. It's not like being a sojourner somewhere where you're visiting for a while. Like, we stayed at someone's house. No, you dwell here. It is a word that means like, this is your home. This is where everything begins. So he says, dwell in your hearts through faith as you being rooted and grounded in love. That word rooted gave me pause because when you look, what do roots do for a tree? Let me stop and think about that for a moment. What do roots do? It's okay, you can respond. <laughs> what, what do roots do? They feed, right? They feed you. And so he's praying, I'm praying that you're going to be fed in Christ, what else do roots do? They don't just feed. They strengthen, right? They, they make it possible for a tree not to topple over if the slightest wind comes along. In fact, if you, it's, uh, I, I went out to um, South Dakota one time on a retreat, and they had had a terrible ice storm that had gone through out there. And it was fascinating to me because I saw not a single root sprung tree because they were all snapped off. And that was fascinating to me because they don't have water in South Dakota. <laughs> like it's very dry. So these roots go down forever, you know? If you have an ice storm in Arkansas, you walk around and there's just tree after tree, the, the root balls just sticking up out of the ground because its roots are just lying at the surface. They're just, and you know this if you ever try to dig near a tree in Arkansas. We tried to lay sod near, we got big trees in our yard. We were trying to lay sod, it was horrific because you know, we're trying to break up the soil and we go down that far and there's just this mass of roots because we have so much water, you know? And, and there's a lesson in that, you know, like, we, and we look at, if we look at Jesus talking about seeds being sown, he even talks about that. He talks about how like, if faith doesn't take root, if it doesn't drive roots down, it's when, the, when harsh things come, when the sun comes and the winds blow, you know, that, that plant is not going to be able to withstand it. And so Paul, when he says, I want you rooted in love, 
What he's telling us is that love is what feeds you and that love is what makes you strong. The love of Christ is what feeds you and it's what makes you strong. And he goes on and he says, and grounded in love. And actually grounded here, I think it almost in some ways intensifies when he talks about dwell in your hearts rather than rooted. Though the word ground we you know, associate with roots. It's actually the word there is a construction term. I would really like it if we would translate this instead being rooted and having a firm foundation, having a foundation in love. That word there, grounded, is a word for laying a foundation for a house. Um, so he realizes that love, it feeds us, it strengthens us, and it's what everything else is built upon. Right? If, if that's missing, and he, you know, Paul tells us that. He tells us, like, if you don't have love, you're just a noisy gong. You know, <laughs> like, you're just making a bunch of noise. You're, you're just almost that fool's gold kind of faith, right? Um, let's keep moving. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend. And actually, I mixed up a word earlier when I talked about strengthen. The power to comprehend. Actually, here, this word power means not so much might or strength. This has to do with ability. That you might have the ability, and this is the word which I jumped the gun earlier. This is the word where it's, you have enough strength, enough strength to, and the word comprehend here is to seize hold of or grab. And it's so much richer if we were to read it that way. If we get to the roots, no pun intended here, the roots of these words, Listen to it this with new ears if I read it really drawing on this. I pray that you may have enough strength to seize hold of with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so you may be filled with all the fullness. And I love that. He's like, I want you to know the unknowable and be filled with the fullness of God. Which obviously... How can we contain the fullness of God? Like, that's staggering to our imaginations. That we could contain the fullness of God. And yet he prays that we know that which is unknowable and we be filled with that which we cannot contain. What's powerful to me in this is that he's making it really clear. He's not just being sort of What's the word I'm looking for here? Aspirational in that prayer. Like, I don't really think that will happen, you know, but I want you to really, really believe. No. He full on believes in his praying that the fullness of Christ's love, that sacrificial agape, which is the word used here, that, that, that unconditional love, that it would absolutely, completely fill who we are and honestly replace everything within us so that we're a new creation. And he full on believes that. It's not like, oh, I want you to be, I want you to aspire to be sort of Christ like, but no, I want you to have the very fullness of God in you, his strength, his power. And this word here, when we get to this word for power, it's the word that we have for, di it's, we got our word dynamite from. It's dunamis. I mean, it's like, you know, I want you to have power that can explode something. <laughs> you know, it's, it's a big, powerful word. No pun there intended. But, and, that, and he repeats that a couple different times. He, he talks about having the power, the dunamis, to comprehend with all the saints was the breadth, length, height, and depth to know the love of Christ. And this word know here, we'll drill down just a teensy bit on it. It's one thing for us to intellectually know something, and it is another thing for us to experientially have it become a part of who we are and know it. You know, there are different ways of knowing things. It's one thing to say that I know some mathematical facts. It's another thing to say I know my son and I know my son well, right? <laughs> Those are two very different levels 
of knowledge. Or it's one thing for us to go through like a class on something and say we know it, and it's another thing to get out there and do it. And all of you who have gone on in careers that you were supposedly trained for, you know this, and I mean know it in the fullest sense of that word. You get told how it is, and then you go out there and you do something, and it's like, oh, this is a very different game than what I was told. He's talking about the word that's used here. They have different words for no, and the words that, that is used here is that sort of full experiential knowledge of the love of Christ. And I ran into, to me, a manifestation of this verse in a pastor I knew. He went on a great banquet weekend. And great banquet is like pilgrimage or curcio. It comes out of that same tradition. It's a renewal weekend. And this is a pastor who had been preaching for probably at that time 30 years, I would guess, easily. Um, a very stoic kind of, he's Minnesotan, at, uh, grew up in Minnesota, and just very, not emotive at all, uh, very deadpan about everything. And he went on this great banquet weekend, and he came back, and he said, I think it was on the, let's see, I think it was on the third night that he was there, second night that he was there, second night that he was here, he found himself just weeping into his pillow because the reality of grace, while he had preached it for years and he knew it, he hadn't experienced it and felt it wrapped around him and go through to the marrow of his bones. And he was in this crucible of care. If you ever get a chance, one of them pilgrimages is coming again sometimes. <laughs> you know, if you ever get a chance, I'm telling you, go, because it is a crucible of care and grace. And this man was just reduced to tears by experiencing the reality of it. Not just knowing it existed. Not believing it at a head level it existed, but experiencing. That's the knowledge that we're talking about here. And we're just about ready to wrap this up. So you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him, by the power at work within us, is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine. To him be glory in the church in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Now to him by the power at work within us, who is able. That's actually, that is another repetition of word there. It's actually now to him who by the power, dynamos, at work within us, has dynamos to accomplish abundantly, has the power. I think they translated some of these things so it wouldn't sound sing-songy, but then we lose, you know, the, the emphasis there. This is the one who has the power to give the power. The father of fathers, the one who can fill us with what is when we are unable to contain all the fullness of, the one who can strengthen us and give us knowledge beyond what is knowable. And he says at the end of this, like after praying all these things that to me are really big prayers. You know, like he's, he's reaching to the heavens literally and figuratively for all that he could ask for us. And then he says, and God can do more than we ask even more than we can imagine. We probably believe too little, too much. You know? Really pour our hearts out to God. I want to leave you with this. I would encourage you to start praying for one another. I'm going to take this to heart and start taking some time. I mean, I pray for you when I know individual needs going on and I pray for you on a regular basis, but usually it's about the needs that I know going on. It's not about what Paul is saying here, that you would be rooted and grounded and have the strength to grab, seize hold of the fullness of Christ's love. I actually took time this morning, I think it was a, I, I never want to say that not having someone in, in Sunday school was a godsend, but it just so happened that I didn't have anyone this morning 
but I had decided last night I wanted to come in the sanctuary and be able to pray for each one of you. And, and it, the great thing is you all sit in the same places. So I could literally walk through the church and pause at a pew, and I could pray for the week so they weren't here because I know where they'd be if they were here. And I could pray for Marianne. And I prayed for the people who aren't on the boat right now on a Sunday morning, you know, because I know where they have sat and prayed for them because I miss them and to strengthen them. And I prayed for you sluters because you, you're right where I pictured you. <laughs> Each one of you to walk about and to pray for you. I want to encourage you to do the same, but specifically, pray Paul's prayer that we really know the fullness of Christ. Because if we know that, we will be unshakable. Absolutely unshakable. All those other things that we pray about we can endure if we have that. It almost, it almost becomes a mute point. Go ahead and continue to pray about those things. But once we fully know the fullness of God, man, those other things, we can weather them. Praise God, our God is that good. Let's pray. Holy God, we thank you that <clears throat> the power of the Holy Spirit, the fullness of who you are, can and does abide within us. <clears throat> Lord, this passage is one of the few places in Scripture where we see the fullness of the Trinity reflected as well. Paul talked about bowing his knee before the Father, and then he prayed about the love of Christ being us. He prayed about the power of the Holy Spirit being within us. He prayed for the fullness of your divine nature to be a part of our makeup of the inner person of each one of us. Lord, we pray that the Holy Spirit would guide us to this kind of fervent intercession for one another. We can't always change or affect what's going on out there, but we can definitely have an impact on how we weather the storms. We love you, Lord, and we want to honor you, and we need to be strengthened in the inner being in order to do that with the fullness of this one precious life you have given us. And lastly, God, we come before you as believers praying words that Christ taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, friends, this is a time when we can honor God through the giving of our tithes and offerings. And do I have somebody who would be... Parker, would you mind grabbing the plates or somebody back here? Um, have a um, moment to honor God through the giving of our tithes and offerings. God is so generous to us. Let us be generous in our response. God, we offer these gifts to you and ask your blessing upon them so that others may know the fullness of your grace. And Lord, that it may equip us as well as disciples. In your word, you tell us to go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, not just decisions. Yes, we need to see people embrace your love, but when we embrace your love, we need to learn and grow and become rooted and grounded in that love. May these gifts also work toward that end to your glory. In Christ's name we pray, amen. There's an ancient, uh, I believe it's Swedish,
proverb that basically says, if you want people to cross the ocean, don't tell them how to build boats. Give them a love of the sea. They'll figure out how to build boats. You know, <laughs> like, folks, we can, we can work on those sort of tangible expressions of being the church. All I want, I could tell you the, the right thing to do and the wrong thing to do, but if, if you walk out of here loving God even just a little bit more today, I don't have any doubt, you'll figure that out. <laughs> you'll figure it out. The Holy Spirit will lead you. And that's my prayer for you. So now, as we go forth, may the love of God the Father, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ abide with you now and forever. Amen.